we're moving, uh, we're still on the non-Roman part of proceedings, but we're moving to Italy. Um, and uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Mike Burns, who, um, as I've just heard, is a, actually a consultant at the museum at Mougin, that's already been mentioned uh, to you. Uh, and he's uh, very much an expert on this topic, uh, as the author of, of a series of articles on Italic uh, armor. Um, and so without further ado, over to you, Mike. Hey, good afternoon. Uh, my presentation is on the development of the sulfatalic cuirass from the 6th to the 3rd centuries BC. Um, the term sulfatalic, it's a broad term for the various Oscan speaking peoples of south central Italy, referred to by the Romans as Apulians, Campanians, and Lucanians and Samnites. Their territories roughly correspond to the modern regions of the Abruzzo, Molise, Basilicata, Campania, and Puglia. A great deal of military equipment has been recovered from archaeological sites in these regions, especially from the sites of Alfadena, Paestum, Ruvo, Eboli, and Gravina. Uh, many of you may not be familiar with the Samnites or other Sulphitalic peoples, so I think it would probably be useful to provide a bit of historical context for the armor that I'll be discussing. Prior to Rome's conquest of Italy in the 3rd century BC, the peninsula was a mosaic of independent peoples, tribes, and states. Southern Italy was dominated by a number of populous and warlike peoples who spoke Oscan, a language related to Latin. The Samnites were the most prolific of these Oscan speaking peoples and controlled a large territory among the mountains of South Central Apennines in what is now the Abruzzo and Molise. Um, the Samnites had a reputation as fierce fighters who would ravage the regions of the plain and coast. The Roman historian Livy described them as rude highlanders, a people hardened by the use of arms. The threat of Samnite expansion eventually brought them into conflict with Rome, who subsequently fought a series of wars against them in the fourth and third centuries BC. Livy claimed they were by far Rome's most tenacious enemy, and many other ancient writers believed much of the Roman panoply was borrowed from the Samnites. During the 5th century BC, Samnites migrated into the coastal and lowland regions bordering the Apennines. Much of this coastal territory was controlled by the Etruscans and Greeks, who often employed the Samnites as mercenaries. By the start of the 4th century, almost all of these Etruscan and Greek cities in southwestern Italy had fallen to the Samnites. These coastal Samnites became known as Companions and Lucanians, and a great deal of armor has been recovered from warrior burials in these cities. The Companions and Lucanians were heavily influenced by the Greeks, and this is reflected in their armor and military equipment. There are many hybrid pieces which show a fusion of ideas and features from both cultures. To give you an idea of the typical self Sulfatalic warrior. Uh, this is one of Peter Conley's paintings. Um, many of you might have seen it if you've taken the chance to go up on the third floor. Um, it gives a pretty good idea of their panoply um, they, with a short tunic, a broad bronze belt, and a type of armor um, which is characterized as a, a type of harness. Um, The focus of most research on ancient arms and armor has been devoted to the Greeks and Romans, whose military systems stand as the two great polarities of interest in cl classical warfare. There is, however, a large and important body of evidence from southern Italy which helps to bridge the gap in the continuum of the development of arms and armor. Despite the large quantity of evidence that exists, Sulfatalic armor is often treated as ancillary to the better documented accoutrements of the Greeks and Romans. In many instances, 
Italic armor is mistakenly identified as Greek, while other pieces are regarded as rustic or inferior imitations. The superiority of Greek armor is often presumed by many without understanding the reasons why italic equipment differed in form and how it was meant to function. Much of my talk today will attempt to show you how Greek concepts of style and design were integrated into existing italic forms of armor to suit their tastes and needs. Um, the three types of armor I'll be talking about today are the cardiophylax, the triple disc cuirass, and the anatomical cuirass. And the issues that I'll be examining are technical aspects, which basically a description of the armor and how it was worn, development and chronology, its effectiveness, and product issues of production, and design concepts and ideology. This is a statue of the warrior from Capistrano, Capistrano warrior, which is now in the Chieti Museum. From the 8th to the 6th century BC, the most common form of armor among the Italic peoples were bronze discs or pectorals that were suspended over the heart and back by a harness of straps and hinged shoulder plates. These discs, called cardiophylax, or heart protector were relatively small, ranging from 18 to 28 centimeters in diameter. The protective value of the cardiophylax is clearly limited, so it is likely that it had a symbolic meaning, perhaps to do with the status, of a, a status as a warrior. Many examples are de decorated with intricate incised or embossed designs of animals and geometric patterns which might have had some type of ritual significance. The Capistrano warrior is a life-size statue and dates from the 6th century BC, and it provides a three-dimensional view of how this harness was worn across the body. Leather straps were used to suspend a sword. The sword's unusual location high up on the chest helped to keep it out of the way and prevent it from hindering the warrior's movements. It may also have provided some small degree of protection. Okay, this is a, a drawing by Peter Conley showing an exploded view of the, um, the cardiophylax harness worn by the Capistrano warrior. Um, the cardiophylax harness was a complex arrangement of leather straps supplemented by a single strap compro comprised of three hinged plates made of bronze backed with iron. The hinged shoulder strap was worn across the white right shoulder and riveted to the pectoral discs. Warrior burials are the most common context in which military equipment is found in southern Italy from the 6th to the 3rd century BC. Although these are ritual depositions, they do offer a unique opportunity of recovering near complete panoplies of equipment, which can be close, closely dated by other grave goods, such as pottery and coins. This burial, excavated in 2011 in the Abruzzo, shows a warrior with the cardiophylax worn over his heart, and it even has a uh, bronze neck guard. This equipment is very similar to the assemblage in the Mijun's Museum, um, seen here on the right, which seems to have been the standard panoply for a high-status Italic warrior of the central Apennine region during this period. Okay, this is a view of the cardiophylax uh, pectoral plates and the strap as it would uh, curve over the uh, the right, rest over the right shoulder. It may have acted as a counterbalance to the weight of the sword, which was attached by leather straps. The quality of the workmanship for the cardiophallax is consistently high and distinctively italic in its decor decorative motifs. 
This is another type of cardiophylax uh, pectoral that is often found, and these don't have a metal strap attached to them. They were often had uh, leather straps, and this one dates uh, to the 6th century BC. Um, it is decorated with numerous incised motifs and swastikas, a symbol often associated with good luck. This type of pectoral was um, used all the way into the 4th century BC. This uh, is another variant of the uh, cardiophylax from Trocola and dates from the end of the 6th century to the beginning of the 5th century. The pectorals and the connecting strap between them have all been made from a single piece of bronze. There is also a separate strap um, across the other shoulder. It's unclear how this was used. We don't have a, a point of reference like we do with the Capistrano warrior. Um, depictions of Sultitalic warriors on bases show that the single disc type of, if you want to call it a cuirass, lingered on into the fourth century, but these become exceedingly rare. Overall, the cardiophylax would have been, would not have been a very effective form of protection, but its significance in the development of armor is in the way it influenced italic armor design. For the next three centuries, the characteristic form of armor in southern Italy was a harness composed of bronze pectorals suspended by separate bronze plates. And now we'll move on to the triple disc cuirass. This is a small statuette in the Louvre, which is believed to come from Sicily, depicting a uh, Samnite warrior in his characteristic um, costume with the short tunic and uh, triple disc uh, cuirass. And to the right is a companion um, hydria, I believe, in the British Museum, which also depicts a companion warrior in a similar type of uh, cuirass. Um, at the end of the 6th century, a new type of body armor appeared in South Central Italy, which had breast and back plates, which are composed of three embossed discs, two upper and a single lower one. Most of these cuirass had tiny perforations along the edges of the breast and back plates, where a lining would be attached to increase their protective value and give greater comfort. Um, it's believed that I, I've actually examined a belt which still had the textile backing to it and a leather sort of edging along it. And it's probably the same way that they um, secured a backing to these type of cuirasses. Um, Along with the broad bronze belt and short tunic, the triple disc tun uh, cuirass is one of the most distinctive items from the uh, self italic warrior's panoply. These range roughly 28 to 33 centimeters square, so they're not, they, they are bigger than the um, single disc uh, type of cuirasses, but they're still not all encompassing. Um, basically, this diagram here shows how a complete version um, would have been composed with two side plates, which were a single piece of metal, and two shoulder plates, which were composed of two separate hinged um, pieces of metal. Uh, the cuirass was slipped on over the head like a life vest or a poncho and fastened at the sides using hook and ring attachments. These side plates were, okay, yeah. Uh, the hook clasp on the side plate allowed it to be secured to a chain that was riveted to the breastplate. You often find in many of these breastplates a number of links so it could be adjusted in size. Um, these are a couple close-ups of triple disc cuirasses in the Naples Museum and it just shows the arrangement of the way they were actually secured to the um, 
breast and back plates. You can see the one on the left, it's a ring attachment which is riveted to the breast and back plate and the one on the right is hinged. Um, I found examples with two rings, three rings, and you know the hinged ones as well. Um, so it varies. Um, this is um, a cuirass from Alpha Dana, and the earliest examples of the triple disc cuirass have been found in Alpha Dana and the Abruzzo and date from the end of the 6th to the beginning of the 5th century. Um, armor made in imitation of the human body is a distinctively Greek concept. And this is an abstraction of the human torso. The two upper discs are meant to represent pectoral muscles and the lower is the abdominal muscles. Um, it's, an italic, it, it's an italic interpretation of a Greek idea. <coughs> okay, a separate reinforcing strip was often uh, attached or riveted to the top of each the breast and back plate to provide extra strength. Often these um, kind of cuirasses would have some cracks along them from uh, wear and tear. Um, between the two upper pectoral discs and the lower abdominal one are two teardrop shaped lobes which protrude outward from the breast plate. These two uh, breast and back plates from the Ashmolean are also from Alpha Dana. Um, and they're it's characteristic of this early type of armor that the breast and back plate are identical. Um, they're of robust construction, this type of armor, and average about two millimeters in thickness, which is comparable to that of a Greek muscle cuirass. Um, the Alpha Dana type is by far the largest and most homogeneous group of triple disc cuirasses. <coughs> and almost all have been found in the Abruzzo and Malise regions, which corresponds roughly to the territory of the Samnites. By the second half of the fifth century BC, triple disc cuirasses begin to appear in the coastal regions surrounding the highlands of Samnium. This corresponds to the period of war and conquest in which these Sultatalic peoples had seized control of Greek and Etruscan cities on the coast. It is during this time that the relatively uniform Alpha Dana type cuirass, uh, triple disc cuirass, disappears, and a wide variety of types begin to appear, emerge in the territories of the Apulians, Companions, and Lucanians. The variation between the breast and back plates are remarkable not only between regions, but even within the same communities. <coughs> this example on the left-hand side is from Ponte Cagnano, and the one on the right is in the British Museum, and that's reputedly from Ruvo. These two examples um, are in the uh, Mujins Museum, and again, they show a diversity of of different ways, but they all keep the same form, the three discs and the same type of arrangement, harness arrangement in the way the armor was designed. Um, this is a warrior burial from Pistum, and it dates to approximately 380 to 370 BC. Pistum is a, a very special case in the number of, of cuirasses which have been found there, approximately about 11 of these triple disc types and a number of other types as well. So they can provide a snapshot of the development of these cuirasses over time from when they see, when the Lucanian sees the city in 
approximately 410 BC all the way to the beginning of the third century, I mean, beginning of the fourth century BC. This is another example. This one was of a, a young man, approximately 25 to 30 years old. And um, you can see the broad bronze belt at the uh, bottom of his at the waist there. And that's the example on the, the right-hand side is when it's been cleaned up and put in the museum. Okay, the Italic warrior's weapon of preference was the javelin. And during the 6th century and 5th centuries, the South Italic warriors were base basically fought as, as light javelin men and were loosely organized. But through the 4th century and into the 3rd century, we see increasingly they become better armed, better armored, and they're better equipped for hand-to-hand -hand fighting. It, it, it seems that this is gradually what is happening. Um, analysis of the various types of armor used by the South Italic peoples shows there was a preference for lighter forms of equipment. The use of the javelin almost necessitates that. Um, you know, uh, it's just a type of weapon that requires a looser type of formation. It is quite clear from the harness design of the triple disc cuirass that little attempt was made to protect the entire torso. Italic warriors were undoubtedly aware of the difference in protection this type of armor offered compared to the Greek type muscle cuirasses or the linothorax. Um, it would seem that the primary tactical consideration afforded by this type of armor was its increased mobility, agility, its lighter weight. The fact that the Romans were using similar types of armor well into the second century BC is indicative of its effectiveness and versatility. Well, here's the um, image which has been used to advertise this event, which um, is from a companion crater, and it shows a, uh, a warrior who's been disabled by a thrown javelin. He's on the ground there and he's about to be dispatched by a companion warrior wearing a triple disc cura, uh, cuirass and wielding an axe in his other arm. He's, although it follows the line of the crack there, it's, it's another javelin. Um, it, it basically is their characteristic way of fighting to throw javelins and then follow up with hand-to-hand -hand combat. Um, One thing in understanding this type of equipment is that the shield is always the warrior's primary means of defense. So armor needn't be all-encompassing to be effective. Uh, the triple disc cuirass was an essentialist form of protection. You can see that their, their idea is to protect the heart, thoracic blood vessels, and the abdomen. As long as that was protected, they were pretty much you know, considered it, the shield would protect the rest of the body. Um, so that was just a, uh, a backup, if you will. This is a plate from the um, Museum of Fine Arts in Boston. And during the fourth century, a new group of triple disc cuirass were manufactured, which were decorated with Hellenic style deities and ritual imagery. This example from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, which is allegedly from Volsi, has discs which have been decorated with images of Helios, Selene, and Hercules. It is possible that the warriors sought the assistance of, or divine protection of these deities. What is interesting is that these are Greek-style motifs and decorative features being used to adorn italic armor. It seems likely from the high quality of, of these artistic features that were, they were being produced by Greek craftsmen for South Italic warriors. This is a very well-known cuirass from the Bardo Museum, which shows a very high standard of workmanship. 
and has a back plate decorated with floral motifs on the two upper discs and the head of Minerva on the lower one. The top edge of the back plate is decorated in imitation of a temple. The lintel is adorned with a row of libation bowls and ox skulls supported by four ionic <coughs> columns. The breastplate is similar to the back plate but is def differentiated by a dipping neckline embellished with a necklace of acorns. The bardo cuirass is, was found near, in a tomb near Carthage and is often attributed to one of Hannibal's veterans during the Second Punic War. The form of the cuirass, its decorative features, and related examples suggest that it was made sometime during the fourth century BC. It is far more likely that it was brought to Carthage by a Sulphitalic mercenary and was probably in the ground a full century before the Punic Wars with Rome even began. A lesser known example um, of this type of cuirass is from the Naples Museum uh, here on the left, which is identical to the uh, Bardo one, and this is believed to have come from Ruvo. The only difference between the two cuirasses is the way the w in which the um, shoulder plates have been attached. Um, and this dates, this one from Ruvo dates to the first half of the fourth century BC. It seems highly probable that these two cuirasses were made in the same workshop, which gives us some insight into how these armors were being produced. Another example, which has been an, on the antiquities market in Bern, features a near identical form, but with slightly differing decorative motifs. The head of Minerva has been replaced with that of a gorgon, and in the center of the cuirass is a three-pronged starburst, which has replaced the lotus plant, which features on the other uh, breastplates. This suggests that a template of some type was being used to produce the decorative features on the breast and back plates, but that they could be modified to suit individual tastes. <laughs> Another very fragmentary example of this type of cuirass was found in the Cirrus Valley and dated to the start of the fourth century. Once again, we find near identical form and decorative motifs to the other magnagration type cuirasses, except that the two upper discs have been replaced with a starburst design and the lower disc is uh, concentric circles. Um, to the right there are two side plates which were found on their own and they're identical to the side plates that are used on these other ones. It's surprising that there are so many of these cuirasses around and it, it clearly suggests that quite a number of these were made in the same workshop perhaps. Aside from the production of similar or identical cuirasses is the possibility that matching sets of armor were also made. These, these might include panoplies which were decorated with the same type of motifs. A close-up of the helmeted head on the bardo cuirass shows that it is strikingly similar to those found on the upper part of the pair of greaves in the Mugins Museum. <coughs> The hook clasps that are used to secure the side plates of the triple disc cuirasses are sometimes similar or identical to the clasps found on belts. The only difference between them is that the hook, hook portion of the clasp on the side plates of the cuirass is turned outwards and away from the body. There are several panoplies from Pistum which show identical types of clasp with the triple disc cuirass. Pistum, however, is one of the few sites in which the cuirass and belts are found together and are relatively complete. It is often the case that triple disc cuirasses, just the plate or the back plate exist, and the side plates or the shoulder plates have disappeared. Oh, um, and often 
those in collections are not associated with a belt. This is an example from the uh, J. Paul Getty Museum. Um, less commonly found are examples of armor which are poorly made or appear to have been rushed. Small details such as fittings, attachments, or hinges may be roughly finished. On this example, it's a bit more obvious as the upper left and lower discs are touching while a disproportionately wide space has been left with the upper right disc. The attention to detail, which is evident in the manufacture of most triple disc cuirasses, is lacking in this example. This suggests that it was made by someone in a hurry or without a great deal of experience. The manufacture and circulation of military equipment is something we know very little about. Archaeologically, I am unaware of any workshops, tools, partially finished pieces, or scrap that is related to the production of arms in Italy during this period. And ancient sources say very little about this subject. Um, there is, however, an enlightening passage by Diodorus who describes how Dionysus, the tyrant of Syracuse, was preparing for war and had gathered skilled workmen from Greece, Italy, and Carthaginian territories for he was eager to have every one of his soldiers armed with the weapons of his people. Every space, such as porticos, back rooms of temples, as well as the gymnasia and the colonnades of the marketplace were crowded with workers. Work was even conducted in private homes. This passage narrates an atypical sit uh, situation in which large numbers of foreign troops, many of them companions and Samnites, were equipped by a Greek tyrant who had the resources to manufacture military equipment on a lavish scale. The fact that the workmen use every space to produce arms seems to indicate the mobility, small scale, and versatility of this process. It suggests that no special workshops or heavy equipment were required, and that even small communities had the potential to manufacture arms provided the means and know-how were available. It also implies that there were no large stocks of military equipment available in these areas, and that it was much easier to gather craftsmen to a central location and organize their efforts than to commission them individually. This indicates that the usual scale of manufacture was at a local level, geared for local needs, and that, large scale, that a large-scale arms trade probably didn't exist. The triple disc cuirass continued to evolve throughout the fourth century BC. Despite being manufactured in different regions, we can discern some trends in the development of this type of armor. Often, the discs become much smaller, the rims which surround the discs begin to get narrower. There is a differentiation often between the breast and the back plates and they're often decorated with Hellenic style motifs. This triple disc cuirass, with what once part of the uh, Axel Gutmann collection, shows the latest evolution of the form by the end of the fourth century. The discs are much smaller and the rims around them narrower. There is also a differentiation between the breast and back plate, evident from the dipping neckline and the raised collarbones and ripose. The appearance of realistic anatomical features on this abstraction of the human torso show how Greek concepts were gradually beginning to take hold among the South Italic peoples. Which brings us to the next form of armor, the Italic anatomical cuirass. By the middle of the fourth century BC, a new form of Italic cuirass had emerged, which was composed of a breast and back plate that had either stylized or realistic anatomical features. 
Like the triple disc cuirass, the breast and back plates of the italic anatomical cuirass were held in place by separate shoulder and side plates. This tomb painting from Nola depicts a group of warriors returning from battle with trophies and is dated to the last quarter of the fourth century. Two of the warriors are depicted wearing rectangular cuirasses with a bronze with anatomical features. This is a diagram of the armor as, as it would have been complete. You can see that it has two side plates directly attached to the back plate and are hinged, and two shoulder plates which are hinged attached to the um, breastplate. The musculature of the early, earliest version of the italic anatomical cuirass is quite distinctive and unlike anything found on the Greek muscle cuirasses of the same period. On the breast, breastplate, the collarbones have been indicated an anatomical feature that is usually absent in Greek muscle cuirasses. The outline of the pictorial muscles are delineated by a single thick raised line which rises to the center of the chest at the sternum. The abdominal region is indicated by a rectangular box shape which has a pronounced apex that projects between the pictorial muscles. The stomach muscles are depicted using incised lines which run down the center of the sternum to the navel and are bisected by two horizontal lines. The back plate has two raised parallel lines which represent the dorsal muscles on either side of the spine. Unlike Greek muscle cuir the Greek muscle cuirass, there is no depressed groove to indicate the spinal column. There is also curving lines similar to, in shape to an upside down number two, which represent the shoulder blades. There has been no attempt by the armorer to make the musculature appear in a natural way. In contrast to the Greek muscle cuirass, the italic version is highly stylized. It is a schematic rendering of the torso, which could be easily replicated through its simple design. This is a breast and back plate uh, from Eboli, um, an archaeological site not far from Pystum, uh, and is um, from the tomb of a Lucanian warrior, which dates approximately to 340 to 330 BC. So this would have been during the Samnite War period. Uh, the Italic anatomical cuirasses are sometimes confused with Greek muscle cuirasses, but there are significant differences. The dimensions of the italic breast and back plates were much smaller and shallower than their Greek counterparts and were never meant to be di joined directly. Most of these cuirasses are roughly rectangular in shape and measure 28 to 37 centimeters in um, high and 25 to 30 <coughs> centimeters wide. The italic cuirasses also have perforations along the edge for aligning, a feature which is not found on Greek muscle cuirasses. This is, um, again, another drawing by Peter Conley, which shows a, a much clearer rendering of the, uh, the design of this type of cuirass, the italic anatomical cuirass. Um, And this is the side view, both a photograph of the one from the uh, warrior's tomb in Eboli and a drawing by Peter, which illustrate the new type of side plate, which was hinged uh, directly to the back plate. And this innovation was clearly inspired from the hinges found on Greek muscle cuirasses. They've even copied a lot of decorative features, such as a wave pattern, a pleak, which is often attached to the hinge. This is an uh, example from the Royal Armories in Leeds, and is believed to come from the site of, of Kumai in uh, Campania. There is a remarkable uniformity 
and the anatomical features of these early Italic cuirasses, despite being found throughout southern Italy in the territories of different peoples. The simplicity of its design and form perhaps made it easy to replicate and individual touches could be added, such as incised or oblique decorative features. This one um, has been decorated with oblique uh, gorgons on where the nipples would, would have been. Quite soon after the appearance of the anatomic, italic anatomical cuirass, versions with more realistic musculature begin, uh, begin to appear, such as this example, which is now in the Mugin's collection. Although they retain the same basic harness form as the earlier cuirass, the outline for the breastplate is no longer rectangular, but instead follows the contours of the body. Uh, you can see it's dipping neckline, you can see where the arm is, you've also got the, uh, more of a curve which follows the way the pectoral muscle and the arm would meet. Um, the side plate also is much larger with a wider hinge on the back plate and two ring fasteners instead of the single hook fastener of the earlier types. These are all features which are copied from the uh, Greek muscle cuirasses. It's quite similar to the example, this is a close-up of the Nola painting, and the Mugin's example is quite similar in the musculature as that depicted here on the uh, Talic Warriors painting. So it's likely that this dates from the last quarter of the 4th century BC. While these new italic anatomical cuirasses were coming into being, the, they were still contemporary with the triple disc cuirass, which was still being used by um, many peoples. But you do see examples. This one's um, from the Axel Gutmann collection, or copy from the Axel Gutmann collection at Mainz. And, um, but by this period, by the end of the fourth century, the triple disc cuirass is an old fashioned form of armor. It's at least 150 years old by the time the Italic anatomical cuirass has appeared at the middle of the fourth century. Um, this example shows um, a triple disc cuirass which has had plates welded on to each side of it to increase its protective value. Um, it seems to be an attempt to update the cuirass so that it provides more protection. And um, this is a side view of it where they've enlarged the side plate even, even more and provided it with two ring attachment that's found on the uh, an anatomical cuirasses. Um, The anatomical cuirass from the warrior's tomb at Marcellino, this one dates um, from 330 to 320 BC and appears to be reminiscent of the earlier highly decorated triple, cuirass, triple disc cuirasses. It is ornately decorated with protomes of a satyr's head on a wide girdle with a pectoral, with a pectoral as well. Um, the form of the breast and back plates are those of a later anatomical cuirass. It's, it is exceptional, however, that the anatomical features are those of a female torso. The occupant of the tomb, however, was male. The appearance of the cuirass suggests that it was probably intended to characterize an Amazon, as it is similar in depictions found on red figure vases of the same period. This type of cuirass brings to mind cavalry sports equipment of the Roman imperial period, which depict feminine features and hairstyles thought to be of Amazons. Considering the Amazon's cuirass's date and its context, it is unlikely to have been a piece of sports equipment. 
Um, but it is an unusual piece. Uh, it, it makes one wonder why a, a male war warrior would want armor with the anatomy of a female. But, um, to each their own. <laughs> Um, the musculature of the anatomical um, cuirasses becomes more refined towards the end of the 4th and into the 3rd century BC. It reaches a point where it is almost indistinguishable from the musculature depicted on Greek uh, Hellenistic muscle cuirasses of the late 4th century. Um, details such as cast and inset nipples follow those of the, the Greek cuirasses. There's also additional features. You can see the lengthening of the neck, both on the, the breast and back plate, to provide additional pr protection to the neck. And that's a side view of this case. Strangely, these, these um, later anatomical cuirasses, it, it, they're very, I, I can only think of two examples which are found with side plates, and they're quite small actually. So either this was a variant which didn't make use of side plates or they were falling out of fashion perhaps. Um, And this is the final example of the form. Um, this example is from, uh, is in the Mujin's collection. And the musculature of the cuirass is fully developed and the breast and back plates have rounded edges which are not perforated. But there is a discoloration along the edges which suggests that some type of lining was uh, either glued or glued on some way. Um, on the breast and back plates is an upward extension to help protect the throat and the nape of the neck, similar in function to the collar type <coughs> neck guards found on the long type uh, Greek style muscle cuirasses. Okay, this is a comparison of a, a Greek muscle cuirass and the Italic version, and both of these cuirasses are roughly of the same period. Um, there's been much discussion of the protective value of armor, but what is also important is the serviceability of the equipment, specifically how easily the equipment can be maintained and repaired on campaign, as well as its durability and flexibility on the battlefield. One of the little considered benefits of italic armor design was that its component parts, if its component parts were damaged, they could be much more easily re repaired or replaced than the larger two-piece mus Greek muscle cuirass. The other thing is that they did not have to be fitted to the individual. Um, Xenophon stressed the importance of making a cuirass which was neither too small nor too large, so to give a proper fit. This is something which would have required a great deal of skill and time to manufacture. Italic cuirasses, on the other hand, required no such exactness. Covering the entire torso was not considered a necessity, only that the breast and back plate protected the most vital areas of the, of the torso. Another difference between the italic anatomical and Greek muscle cuirass was overall agility while wearing them. The open design, flexibility, and lighter weight of the italic cuirass allowed a greater range of movement, making it ideal protection for those employing weapons such as the javelin, which would require much more fluid movements than the use of a thrusting spear or pike. On horseback, the Greek muscle cuirass either had to be shortened or specifically modified to accompany, accommodate a seated rider by having widely a widely flared bottom edge. The um, no such special uh, modifications needed to be done to the uh, italic cuirass. Um, 
This is a uh, hydria from the Museum of Fine Arts in Boston, and it shows a pair of what are believed to be either Greek or Etruscan warriors with the muscle cuirasses and round hoplite shields conversing with what is believed to be a companion wearing a triple disc cuirass and a broad bronze belt. You can see the difference right away of, of how all-encompassing the, um, the Greek muscle cuirass is compared to the much smaller italic cuirass. Um, it is interesting that Polybius, writing in the second century BC, describes Roman soldiers who wear a brass breastplate, a span square, roughly around 24 centimeters, which is placed in front of the heart and called a cardiophylax, or heart protector. It would seem that the original concept behind the italic single disc heart protector of the sixth century was retained as its form evolved through Greek influence into the triple disc cuirass and then the anatomical pattern cuirass. The changes in, the cura in these cuirasses show that the self italic peoples were certainly open to Greek concepts, but that this, this did not mean they abandoned their own forms of equipment. Rather, new ideas were filtered and interpreted through their own existing stylistic forms and representation, and then reinterpreted into new hybrid designs. Further development and modification in the second half of the fourth century eventually led to the appearance of the Italic anatomical cuirass. As the Italic peoples became more accustomed with Greek forms of rendering the human body, they began to create their own versions of the muscle cuirass. Um, what, what I've tried to stress today in this talk is basically that Greek and Roman military equipment are not two separate, unconnected entities. They are part of the same continuum of development. And sultitalic armor is an important link between these two military systems. Thank you. very interested in the observation that you made, um, you suggested well, two observations. One is that the relatively small and little, uh, small cure, uh, little disc cuirasses, giving little coverage to where these, you say on the one hand that would help if you turn javelins to give you more mobility. At the same time you also said that the shield is giving most of the, the protection. And as in this picture, the others that you showed as well have clearly hope-like shields, very large shield, double brick shields. And that might seem difficult. I mean, in, uh, having big, unwieldy shields and throwing javelins at the same time is not, I think, something you see in the, in the, in the Greek world that much. So I, I wonder how you, how you explain this sort of uh, intention. Right. Well, the iconography is, is a bit biased because almost all of it, which depict warriors, come from these Greek and Etruscan cities which were conquered by the Companions, Lucanians, and Napoleons. And therefore, they're using these red figure vases, they're using Greek mediums of expression. And that it, it's possible that uh, it, it's an artistic, um, artistic, uh, what's the word? <laughs> yes. But um, it's, it's, it, it's also likely that high status warriors used the Greek hoplite shield. And since most of these depictions are coming from high status burials, that's what we're seeing, a high status warrior with these. But periodically we get glimpses of other types of shields which are not hoplite shields. They're quite clearly from a, a native italic tradition and these appear to be made of wicker, leather, or wood. And some of them appear to be similar in appearance to the scutum. Um, that these appear with the hoplite shield, I, I, I didn't provide any examples in this presentation, um, tell us that 
they were being used at the same time. Um, there is one painting which I from a, a, a companion vase which is a bit of a, of a comedy thing. It reminds me of Don Quixote and Pancho. It, it shows a uh, companion warrior walking along, marching along with a, a pair of javelins on his shoulder, and he, he carries a, uh, a hoplite shield. And behind him is a short, uh, pot-bellied fellow who has one of these native italic type shields, which is oblong in shape and he's walking along. So maybe it has something to do with status. And um, over time, I think that's, that's what happens. These, the uh, Greek aspects or the Greek hoplite shield is replaced by these native Italian types. Okay, thank you. Um, thank you, very good. Uh uh, talk. Um, I'm interested in your links, or uh, whether you start the links with the Etruscan armor, because um, of the Etruscans on my tomb painting show the armor themselves. And I wondered uh, uh, how you connect with those, because obviously the Romans were influenced by the Etruscans as well, especially as they uh, conquered. Could you uh, raise your hand so I can see you? <laughs> I'm here. Oh, there. One, one way. Sorry, right here. Oh, in the middle. In the middle? Yeah. Oh, right. <laughs> Looking over here. I'm going to the links to the Etruscans. Did you study Etruscan armor? Because there's a lot of Yes, um, the Etruscans also show, um, well, they show a greater use of, of Greek style equipment than the Salt Italic peoples. Um, it, it's hard to say why. It, it, it appears that they had more contact with the Greeks than. Uh, the South Italic peoples initially, and for a longer period of time. Um, but even within their uh, their muscle cuirasses and other types of armor, they do use Italic types. Um, what what was the second half of your question? Yeah, sorry about it. Yeah, also, what the link is, because of the Italian people attack the Etruscans, and then the Etruscans are so taken over by the Romans, uh, where is the link to these? Are the Italian people influence the Etruscans in the wrong types, or is it the other way around? And how does that play with the Romans, as you say? Well, it, it's, it's difficult to, to, to pinpoint exact... Um, exact sort of references with the Romans because the, the material from Rome just doesn't exist. The Romans didn't have warrior burials. Um, but, you know, from what little is said in, in written sources, we, we understand that they're using a pictorial type armor um, as opposed, as well as like male armor. Um, this, you know, one of the, Polybius is the earliest description of the Roman army, which is reliable. And, you know, he states that uh, basically warriors with uh, a property value of 10,000 drachma or more would use a coat of mail, while those who didn't have that would use a pectoral, roughly a span square, and it was placed over the heart and called a heart protector. So it's very similar to these type of armors in description, at least. Um, but as far as like actual examples, uh, they just don't exist. You know that we can point out that's Roman. Okay, we have a question over there. Um, yeah, you mentioned that. Sorry. Um, you mentioned that the cardiophylax had like um, a, a, signi a significance. Do you know what that is? Well, we can only guess um, if it had some sort of ritual significance as far as the designs go. Um, it may have been symbolic of being a leader or being part of a warrior class. We know very little about uh, South Italic society of that period, the 6th century and earlier, because the Greeks and Romans basically don't really write about it. Um, it's only later 
when we get the Samnite Wars do we get a, a, a glimpse of, of what their society is like. And none of that, um, you know, will tell you what the significance is of a particular type of armor. Yes, in the back right there. Maybe one last question. Sorry, right there. No, I was talking about it. May as well. Yes, right there. One last question. Hello, you kind of more or less covered what I was going to ask about the form of the Roman pectoral as mentioned by Polybius. I guess we just don't know because none survived. But if you had to give a best guess, bearing in mind comparative evidence and neighboring societies that you described, how do you, what do you think it was like? Like that. <laughs> um, I I had a talk with Peter Conley because the two of us we used to um, one time we drove around Italy for two weeks examining all this type of armor in different museums in Italy, and um, I remember asking him. I said, you know, I really love your paintings and everything, and I I said I'm I'm doing all this research on the South Italic equipment, and I, I keep looking for that square pectoral, which is always illustrated on Republican period Romans, and I haven't been able to find a single example. And he says, oh, well, you know, there, there isn't one. And I said, well, how did you come up with that? Why did you paint that on all these paintings? And he goes, well, it's the description that Polybius gives, that it's a span square, so he, it's an artistic uh, just made up. <laughs> um, it doesn't actually exist. And when we talked about it further, he sort of admitted, well, it was probably more likely that it, that what the Romans were wearing was something like this. Okay, I think sadly we're going to have to leave it here and move we'll on to our next uh, speaker. I know there were several more questions, but thank you very much. Uh, Mike. Yeah.